Good morning, everyone. My name is Raj Subramanian. I'm a developer evangelist at Testimayo. Today, we're going to talk about three things. First of all, we're going to talk about how AI works underneath the hood in Testim. Secondly, we're going to discuss how we reduce the time spent on authoring, execution, and maintenance of automated tests. And finally, we're going to discuss the top features we released in 2019. Before I get started, a couple of sentences about my company. Testimayo uses artificial intelligence for the authoring, execution, and maintenance of automated tests. Our focus is on functional testing, end-to-end -end testing, and UI testing. We support uh, desktop, mobile web, automation and also mobile native app automation on iOS and Android apps. We are not a completely codeless tool. We give the flexibilities for projects and organizations to extend the functionalities of our tool using their own custom code with JavaScript. So to understand why we built Testim, and what problems we are trying to solve, we need to discuss how automation tools and frameworks have evolved in the past decade. So in the past 10 years, there have been so many tools and automation frameworks trying to solve different kinds of problems with automation. But one problem no one has been able to solve till now is the problem of maintenance. About 30% of a tester's time goes in maintaining tests, which is crazy. Imagine if even if you could shave off 5% of the, the time, you can accomplish so many tasks, right? So say, for example, you have a application and you have a login page. And if you have a login button, and change the name from the of the login button from login to summit, what happens? Usually, if it was any other tools or automation frameworks which it, uh, which you know currently, and if you're using them, the test is going to break because you just change the name. And if you're using the name attribute, it, the test will fail. That's where testing comes into the picture. We use what is called dynamic location strategy. So what's happening in real time is for every element you interact with on the page, we extract all the DOM attributes for those elements and then create an object tree. So what's gonna happen is for the same example of login button, even if you change the name of the login button to summit, that test won't break when you use test them because the AI would detect this change and it would say, hey, I see that the name attribute changed, but let me look at the ID attribute. Oh, the ID attribute changed? Let me look at the class attribute. Then it will go look at the parent-child relationship, tag attribute, so on and so forth, right? And that is what we call dynamic location strategy, and I'm going to talk about it in detail in a second. So as a result of doing this, you're going to spend less time on maintenance and your tests are going to be a lot stable and much more smarter. So that's kind of a brief introduction about testing. And uh, a quick introduction about me. I, as I said, I'm a developer evangelist at Testim.io. I uh, work with R&D to make our platform better. I work directly with customers to see how they use our platform and I also help to spread the word of Testim and what we do with our community uh, by uh, writing articles and blog posts on different testing topics, uh, talking at conferences, etc. You can find, find all those links in these slides and you can always uh, tweet me on Twitter as well. With that being said, let's get into the live demo. So I'm going to start with how we use AI underneath the hood, and then slowly we'll cover the rest of the topics. 
So this is what our IDE looks like. I'm just going to go ahead and start creating a test. So I'm going to click on create new. And for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to use our sample application, our demo application. So I plugged in the URL here, and I'm just going to go ahead and start recording a test. So I'm going to click on login, I'm going to enter my name, password, clicking on the login button, selecting some dates from a date picker, then clicking on select destination, I'm scrolling, then going to click on book, going to enter my name, and then I'm going to enter my email ID, and I think that should be good for now. Let me stop recording this test. So as and when I recorded the test, you can see all these uh, the flows get displayed as steps over here, showing you what exactly happened. Let me just run this test quickly to ensure I uh, recorded everything correctly. So I clicked on play, and it's going to run through the same set of steps, which I just recorded. So I'm going to click on login button, going to enter my username, my password, then click on login button over here. Going to select dates from the date picker, and it's going to the flows. And as you can see, you can see what uh, in the background, you can see what steps are running at any instant of time. And if uh, the test passes, you'll see a green icon. If the test fails, you'll see a red icon. Cool. So the tests were recorded properly. That's cool. So just to give you an idea about how we use AI underneath the hood, let's take an example of the select destination button, right? So this is a step where I click on that particular button. First things first, as you can see, we always get images uh, for every element. So it here is showing what is the baseline image and what what is the expected image and what was the actual image found when running the test, right? So that's what you see over here. But talking about the AI and how it works, so if you click on any element and go to view locators, you're going to see this view. So what you see here right now is all the attributes which have been extracted for the select destination button. So you have the text attribute, class attribute, type attribute, tag attribute, so on and so forth. And these attributes were extracted in real time by our AI when we interacted with this button, right? So this is what we call dynamic location strategy because dynamically, it's extracting all the DOM attributes for every element you interact with on the page. And for each attribute, we assign a, a score. So if you see over here, the text attribute has a score of 0.9, then the class attribute has a score of 0.5. So what this means is, based on the historical training of our AI uh, with different websites in the past four or five years, and also, based on the flows I just recorded in this demo website, it already knows that the text attribute is the best way to locate this element. So that's why it automatically provided this score of 0.9. Say if the text attribute changed, what's going to happen is it's going to go to the attribute with the next best score. In this case, it could be either of these class attributes because they have a score of 0.5, right? And this an example of reinforced learning. It's just like how you train autonomous cars. So for autonomous cars, what we do is we feed in different types of images of roads. So you'll feed in a left turn image, a straight road image, then a right turn image, right? And then you train the AI. And you train it with so many different images and it knows when you, when it sees a straight road to go straight. That is because we have trained it based on those images, right? Similarly, we get images of all these attributes and we also have the DOM information. So what's gonna happen is we are training our AI with all these attributes and based on the historical learning, it's giving the score. 
And we also have what is called a confidence level. So right now, the AI says it's 100% confident that it can locate this element, right? But say if some attribute changes, you're going to see this confidence level going down. And again, I'll probably put this in the blog post, which I'll send out after the webinar. This is how they train autonomous cars as well. They have a risk score and a confidence level as well. And then once you see that autonomous training video for the cars, then you'll understand how we pretty much use similar kind of uh, uh, tactic over here as well. Anyways, so that is a little bit about our AI and and uh, to show you how our AI adapts to changes in the UI, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a scenario where a developer comes in and changes something in the UI. And then I'm going to show you how the AI self heals itself, which means that it adapts automatically based on the changes in the UI. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put a breakpoint here and then I'm going to click on play. Okay. And Again, it's going to go through all the flows, which I just recorded until the point it clicks the select destination button. And then it's going to stop there because I put a breakpoint, right? So it's going to enter the name, password, click on login button, select dates from a date picker, and it should stop there. Cool. So it reached a breakpoint. And as you can see, you did see this loading icon, which means it reached a breakpoint. What I'm going to do here in real time is I am going to modify the attributes of uh, the select destination button. Say, for example, I'm a developer and come in and do this change. So I'm going to move this element a little bit, the DOM, okay? And I'm also Instead of select destination, I'm going to change it to choose location. And um, let me change the ID attribute here. And I could change more attributes, but we have only so much time. So I'm going to stop here. Okay. So as you can see, I moved the select destination button, button from here to here, right? So say you're using Selenium or other frameworks currently. And if you're using XPath as a strategy, the test is going to break because I changed the DOM structure, okay? And I also changed the ID. So if we're using ID to locate an element, the test would fail. I also changed the name. So if you're using the name attribute to locate that element, the test is going to fail, right? So see what happens when I actually play the test with testing. So I'm going to click on play and see what happens. If I did everything right, There you go. It still click on choose location and the test tool continues to run, right? That's the beauty of dynamic location strategy, right? So if you see what actually happened underneath the hood, if you look at the images again, you can see that what was expected was select destination, but what it found was choose location. Right. So the AI does tell you that, hey, I saw a change in attribute. But the reason it didn't train the test is because the functionality still remains the same. If you had clicked on select destination or choose location, this test, the next screen which popped up was still the checkout screen because and the functionality still remained the same. So it didn't want to fail the test because just because one attribute changes, you don't want it. You don't want to fail all the following tests, right? And if you go to the locators, once again, if you see over here, the confidence level decreased from 100 to 83%. And if you see this uh, with the color code coding over here, you can see that the text had to be a change. And what happened in real time was the AI detected this change and it automatically looked at, it would have looked at any of these class attributes which probably because it has the same score of 0.5, or it would have looked at, looked at probably this type, this type attribute as well, because that's the same score. And again, the AI makes the addition real time. We don't have to worry about it. But this is how the AI adapts to changes, right? Now you may ask, this is all well and good, 
but what if I really wanted to actually catch that name change, right? That's when we have a lot of built-in assertions you could actually use. So if you see in, in between two steps, you're going to see a plus icon, and if you click on it, you're going to see different built-in actions. You have hover action, navigation action, you can add custom actions using JavaScript. Then you have um, other input functionalities, and I'll talk about some of it in a bit. Then you have different assertions which are available. You can validate downloads, emails, that there are element is visible, not visible, whether, whether an element text is present or not, right? So you can validate it. So say I want to validate an element text, I literally click on this, and then I could just say, for example, I want to validate this checkout name. I literally click on it, and you're going to see that the text validation actually got added, right? And if I wanted to validate the select destination button, I would have done the same. Let me just move this a little bit because the checkout screen usually is visible only in the end. So what I'm going to do is, let me just paste it here. Okay, cool. I pasted it over here. Let me delete this one. So that's how easy you can actually add uh, validations as well. And also you have different inbuilt wait statements. You have you can base weight on element visibility, not visible element text, and you can you you can also uh, give the hard coded sleep. So say for example you're using Selenium, they're similar to the implicit explicit weights and conditional weights you have. So let me just go ahead and uh, save the test so that I don't lose all the changes. And there's a reason why you save the test, which I'll talk about in a second. It's twentieth, let's say demo. So there are two reasons why you want to save the test. The first reason is you have what is called a revision history, which is available. And when you click on see all revisions, you're going to see who and all did what changes to your test as in you save the test. So here it says, for example, 12 minutes ago, I created this test, right? And say, for other people come and change this test and say that you're going to get a revision history of what exactly happened and you can always revert back to the old version as well and also you can add different labels to your test and tag them so say for example i want to tag this test as regression i can just click on regression or you could create your own label if you type something that is not available you're gonna get a option to create your own label but what tagging does for you is when you integrate your tools in a CACD fashion, you could actually say, hey, run all the tests with the labeled regression. And this test is going to start running as well. So that's the reason why you want to save the test. So hopefully that gave you an idea about how our AI works underneath the hood and how we could use built-in actions if we already have with the test them. I, I wanted to cover a couple of more things uh, before I talk about some cool features uh, we released in 2019. So one of the most common necessities with automation is creating reusable components and doing data-driven testing as well. In Testim, you could do that. So let's first talk about how to create reusable components and then I'll talk about how to do data-driven testing. So say for example, you have these login flows and every time you wanna do some type of validation, say you wanna log into the application. If that's the case, it doesn't make sense to keep re-recording the login steps again and again whenever you want to log into the application. Instead, what I could do is I could group these login steps together and create a reusable component, right? So you have an option called add new group and say do August 20th login and click on confirm. 
there you can see that the five steps got contaminated into one single reusable component. And if I double click on it, you're going to see what null steps are within the reusable component. So what this means is the next time you want to log into an application within this test or in any other test, you literally can call that reusable component by calling the name. If you just type in Argus, then you're going to see that reusable component and literally click on this and that's it. You just added the reusable component here, right? So it's that easy to create reusable components. The other thing which is a common necessity would be data-driven testing. Say for example here, I've hard-coded the name, username John, and given a hard-coded password. Say you want to parameterize this username password with different data sets. So what you could do is you're going to type in a variable name, say username. I'm going to type in a variable name here, say password. And then what you're going to do is in your first step, when you click on it, you're going to have, see an option called test data. And when you click on that, you have an option called set dynamic data. When you, do, when you click on that option, you're going to see this uh, page over here. What this is asking you to do is give whatever data sets you want to parameterize your test. So just uh, because we have any limited time, I'm going to copy an example from our help docs. And again, the way to go to our help docs is if you go to click on educate and visit our docs, you're going to go to our help docs and then you can search for pretty much anything you want and we'll probably have a user doc for it because you're going to find answers to about 90 percent of the questions you may have when you initially start using test them in this case i already had open data driven testing doc and here we show you different ways to do data driven testing so Again, offline, you can take a look at it, but for now, the simple, I'm showing you the simplest way where I'm just copying an example and pasting it here. So what you see here is the different data sets in a JSON format. And the reason it's a JSON format is this is the whole architectural stack of testing. So the IDE is built on AngularJS, and behind the scenes, we have Node.js, some components of Selenium, and then we have our own AI algorithm, which does the entire DOM extraction and the learning, right? So on a high level, that's our technology stack. So whatever you do with the test team is going to be JavaScript. And here, you're just giving the data sets you want to your test in a JSON format. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this test. Just going to save it as data driven testing, click on OK. And now, if I run this test and if I did everything right, it should take John, instead of John, it should take in Tom Smith, which was the first data set, which I passed via my parameters. So let's see what happens. There you go, Tom Smith, and the test still continues to run, right? And I'm just going to stop it here um, because the test will run and pass. I just wanted to explain what actually is happening. So if you see here, it tells you what data sets are getting into the test. And if you look at your shared group, which you created and where you used the variable name, you're going to get a field called step params and it exactly tells you what data is passed into these variable names as well. So at any point, you have control on what is actually happening. So those are uh, the ways you do, you create reasonable components and do data-driven testing. Um, another common thing which we have seen is people using different tools for API testing and then different tools for UI testing and this this constant context switching which happens which causes a lot of confusion problems right so that's why we decided you know what 
as testers, our time is valuable and we need to have everything within one IDE. So what we did was we actually built API testing steps within testim itself. So what this means is you can have API tests and the UI tests all within one single user flow. You don't have to be context switching between Postman or SOAP UI and then come back and say use Selenium or other framework which you're using, right? And if you see over here, again, go, going into our built-in steps, if you just type in API, you're going to see the different API actions. We have, we have validate API, we have add API action, and when you click on validate API and give a name, so you're going to see this IDE here, this page, I mean, and there you could send different requests, different header information, body information, and get response back. And you can also add your own code in JavaScript here in case you want to tap into the response and then store that in a variable and then use that variable in any other tests, right? And again, we have uh, examples for this and detailed user docs for this as well. So that is just something you want to keep in mind, okay? Couple of things uh, before I jump on to uh, some of the cool features uh, we, have, we worked on and released. First is the concept of branching. So currently, no other tool or framework uh, has branching options within the IDE itself, right? Yes, of course, uh, if you have uh, connected the Git or other repo, then and if you're using Android Studio or Eclipse, then you have options where you see some branches. But here, we make branching really simple. So say, for example, there are five people collaborating on this exact same test, right? What you could do is you could, oh, I have to first save my test because it did a lot of changes branching so what you could do is you click on fork and then you can create a branch name right say august 20 uh, 2019 right so what's going to happen is it's going to check out that version of the test into your branch and here you could do all these changes without affecting the main branch it's just the same concept of get uh, repos and branches, right? And whenever you're ready to actually merge all these changes back in, you'll just go back to your main branch, which would be the master branch in this case, right? And then you just have to go to my branch, which I just created, and then you just click on merge, right? And that's it. The, those changes, which was in different branch, gets merged into the master branch. A lot of people find this useful because uh, currently we have customers ranging from five people using Testim to at least 70 people using Testim. Imagine you're working in a team of 70 people, right? The odds are at least four people are going to be in the same test at any given point of time. So we help to make the collaboration much easier using this branching option. Let's quickly talk about our CI CD integration, which is another thing important to people. So if you go to the settings here and click on it, you're going to get the settings page. And what you see here is our command line interface or what we call the CLI, right? So we already pre-populated the shell script, which you literally copy and then paste it in your Jenkins uh job or travel ci or team city or bsds or any CSED systems you use what's going to happen is say for example you're using jenkins and you copy the show script and then put it in your job when this command gets executed immediately the test and tests are invoked either on our grids or on your third-party grids which i'll talk about in a second but what's happening is when you execute the shell script, the test and tests are invoked and start running, right? It's so easy to do a CACD integration using 
these commands. And you have a lot of flexibility when using the CLI. So if you see, for example, you want, remember I created a label regression. Say for example, you wanted to run all the tests with the label regression, you can use a label attribute. Say if you have a suite um, and you want to run the sprint one test suite, give the sprint suite attribute. And then you also have a test plan attribute. So you can say test plan and run, say your smoke test test plan, right? And in real time, say you want to overwrite the base URL, which are using for testing. Say you recorded all the tests in your staging environment, and now you want to run your test on the production environment. So what you could do is you could use the base URL parameter, and then you could say, Say I recorded all the tests in staging, you could just say now run all the tests in production and during runtime you're overriding the base URL. And you can also say run all these tests in parallel across four VMs, right? Just by executing this command, you literally executed all the tests with the label regression, a sweet label sprint one, a test plan label smoke tests, and all those tests are going to run with this URL across four VMs. That's the beauty and the flexibility of using the CLI option. And talking about the grids, so what you see here by default is a testing grid. So that's the grid we provide for our customers so that they don't have to deal with the uh, painful job of maintaining their own VMs and browsers. What we do is uh, a customer would ask us, hey, give me four VMs, five IE, seven Safari, 10 Edge, 5 IE 11, and then we set up everything on our grids and you literally just execute this command and use our grids. But say you're using browser stack or SaaS labs or your own third party grids, you can add those grids under the managed grid section and use that as well. So you have that flexibility too. Um, and finally, just wanted to talk about our reporting and bug capture feature. So, Oh, by the way, we also have a inbuilt built in scheduler. So if you don't have your own uh, Jenkins machines at Team City or Travis CI, you could just run this periodically from our built in scheduler. So you could just uh, give a name for the scheduler, uh, choose what time of the day you want to run the scheduled test. Here, you're going to mention what test you want to run. Say, for example, I want to run my regression suite. Um, if you had created it, it automatically populates over here. And then you can choose what grid you want to run the test on. You can notify yourself in case of any errors. Um, you can choose on what browser combinations you want to run the test on and also override the base URL as well. So in terms of the reports um, you get, so quickly just talking about that. For the purpose of this explanation on taking a production project. So if you see over here, you have the run section, it's going to show you all the different runs which have happened over a period of time. So you have the sweet runs tab, which shows you what not suites ran in the last 24 hours, seven days, 30 days, or you can have custom dates and filter based on that. You can filter based on statuses. You can also search for a particular suite. What we basically show here is when the test was started, what is duration, what were the results, what is the level of concurrency in terms of the parallelism, and whether the test passed or failed, right? And you similarly can also get reports on a test level based on, you can filter based on browsers, statuses, based on number of runs. So you have all those options as well. And finally, one cool feature, which at least I think is super cool is, Say yeah, say you're director of engineering or QA or manager of QA, right? And you're managing like say 10 teams. It's close to impossible to go to each and every team and get in, get into the nitty gritty details of how many test cases have passed, test failed, and extra in, in order to get into, in order to understand what status, what progress your teams are making in terms of automation, right? You just need high level details of how healthy your automation suite is and how healthy the teams are doing. So 
For that, we provided this report stack where you give a quick high level snapshot of how the tests are going in your projects. So you can filter based on seven days, 30 days. For example, in the last seven days, you can see 96.33% of the tests ran. Uh, 26,554 tests pass out of the 27,566. What were the number of active tests? What are the average duration? How many new tests were created? How many tests were updated? How many steps change, right? And another super cool feature is our AI automatically identifies based on the past seven day run, what are the most flaky tests? And you can directly drill down into it and try to make it more stable. So those are some of the reporting features we have as well. Okay, so now let's get into some um, cool features we released this year, right? So first thing, let's talk about email validation. Quite often, a lot of companies have applications where you do something and then the user gets an email uh, confirming the actions he did with the application. Say for example, you're using Amazon and you buy a product. Immediately once you buy a product, you get an email saying, hey, you bought this product, this is the price, this is the delivery date, so on and, you know, and so forth. You get all these details, right? What if you want to test that flow? So usually what people do is they use third party email vendors like Shark Laces or Gorilla email uh, to create temporary email addresses and then do that flow of generating that email. Then they have to go to the third party email vendor and see whether they receive the email, right? Which is a lot of context switching and it's a very tedious process. So what we did was we gave email validation feature within testing itself. You don't have to go anywhere. So in this example over here, I could just explain the email validation feature. So if you click on plus and then say uh, generate email address, if you just add this step, you're gonna get the generate email address step. And what this does is every time you run this test, it's gonna generate an email dynamically right and store it in this variable called email address and then you could do the necessary validations you want based on the generated email address so you could add a valid email step and once you click on valid email step you're going to get this step and you can add your own javascript code to do whatever you want so in this case what i'm doing is i'm getting the email and then i'm trying to see whether to that email in the inbox, uh, the user got this email with the subject name, you've been added to the project, array, you've been added to the project as well, right? So you can validate email within testing itself. So just to run this test and give you an idea, so I'm just gonna play this test. Uh, this test is basically opening test them and then adding a user to the project, right? And if you see over here, it's just opening up test them and it's going to uh, go to the project. Going to add, so this the uh, randomly generated email address which is being typed because of the generate email address step. And then when I click on invite, I email gets sent to an inbox within test them and the code which I just added also get executed and try to check whether the email gets sent or not, right? So you can generate email address at random and also validate email. But some people still want to see the inboxes, right? They visually see whether the person gets an email. For that, what you can do is you can go to the settings card and here you have what is called an email service tab. And you, here you can create your own book, inbox and generate email address as well. So when you click on generate email address, an email address gets generated and you also have the inbox. Right now it says there's nothing in the inbox, right? What I'm gonna do is, let me just go back. Um, so, yeah, you, I could have just clicked on copy, that's fine. But yeah, you copy this email and let me go back to the uh, desk. I can do email validation this way as well. 
for now, let me just uh, ignore this test. What I'm doing is I'm getting the generated email address and I'm trying to set that email address. So I type it over here. So I'm generating that, uh, typing the email address and here, instead of this, I'm typing the generated email address and then doing the same here as well. So, I'm just uh, doing set of actions based on the steps which got generated, right? And again, I'm just gonna run this test and don't worry if it fails, but I'm just showing you different ways you can actually generate email addresses, right? And uh, I wanted to mainly show you that email getting sent to the inbox as well. But these are the two ways you can do email validation and check registration flows and stuff within the testing IDE itself. You don't have to do context switching. So right now let's see what happens. It's typing in the email address which I just copied and pasted and it might get sent. Um, and then cool, the test completed successfully. Now if you go to the inbox, let me just close out of this test. Now if you go to the inbox, do the go to the email service if i did everything right there you go you see an inbox with an email and in the code i was checking whether this email has a subject line of you've been added and whether it has a content hurry right so that's how you do email validation and this was something which was requested requested by a lot of customers and so we added that the next thing is multi-tab indicators so the most overlooked aspect of automation and one of the most problematic areas of automation is having tests which involves multiple tabs. There are a lot of scenarios where the uh, test could involve multiple tabs. So for example, say you click on a link on your web page and then on, the new page opens up in a separate tab or when you click on a link on a page, a window pops up, a pop-up window pops up showing some options, right? And those are really hard to automate and it's really flaky. And also you don't get proper feedback on what is actually happening. So we released some updates to exactly let you know what's happening when you have test related multiple tabs. So in this case, for example, let me just play this test. So what's gonna happen is I'm opening Gmail, okay? And it's gonna click on the Gmail tab, uh, which is there on the page and it is uh, going to open the sign in page in a new tab and it's just going to enter some random email address and validate whether the sign in is present or not the sign in uh name right so that's what you see over here and if you see in each step you have this uh indicator saying what first tab so it's showing you in which tab it exactly ran so even if you open one of these properties panel, it clearly show you that the step was executed in which tab, right? So that is something people found really useful. And the coolest thing is if there's some failure, we try to make troubleshooting a lot easier. So one and I'm gonna change this text uh, instead of sign in, I'm just saying sign out, right? And because I want the test to fail and I'm gonna show you how easy we make troubleshooting multiple tab tests so i'm going to click on play right now and the test will fail because instead of uh, checking whether sign in is present i wanted to made the test to fail by saying look for sign out so now it's going to click on sign in tab enter my email email id and then the test will fail cool so let me see here so if you see over here, whenever a test fails, you can see exactly on what tab it actually failed, right? So it shows you 
the test failed when it was running on the second tab and it's showing you a screenshot of the second tab right with an indication of the tab number so we make multiple tab testing really easy by showing this visual indication as well so that is something which people find really useful and that came up as well the next thing was advanced scheduler feature so about 10 minutes ago i was mentioning about our scheduler where say you don't have jenkins or travesia or team city and so you still want to run your regression test periodically you can use our in built-in scheduler and schedule tests right uh, another extension to our scheduler is our advanced tab so if you see over here we have this advanced tab and you click on it we provided flexibility for the users using scheduler feature where they can indicate here how many tests they want to how they want to run the test they want to run the test across one vm or five vms what branch they want to run the test on they could actually choose which branch they could um say if a test fails you can set a number for the the same test to run again till it passes right you can set a number until which a test runs um you can give unique labels to each test run so that you can uni uniquely identify it and you can also override the test timeout of, of the entire test in one shot right from here so that is the advanced scheduler feature which we release as well a couple of small things which we actually release but people have found it so valuable is First thing is generating random values. Say, for example, you have email ID, okay? And every time you um, you run a test, say, my, my, my email ID is rajatestim.io. Say, every time you want to run the test, you want to do raj1, do raj1 at testim.io, raj2 that at testim.io, so that you, you, you can, use a lot of email addresses right or say you want to generate random numbers to put in a, some numeric field in those cases we have what is called the generate random value step so just type in generate random value and then you're going to see this and here we give you an option of generating a random text with just letters just with numbers or a mix of alphanumeric text you can set the length of the random value and also you can add a prefix say uh you want to add something you could do something like uh, uh you can add a prefix of say raj at test him and then what's going to happen is it's going to start adding Raja test them to each of these random values which get generated, but you have a lot of flexibility. So that's what I'm trying to say. So you have to generate random value. And um, that is something we actually uh, uh, released. Another thing we also did was validating radio buttons and check boxes. So if I just type in radio button over here, because I've already had have a test. So let's go here. So you can see, that if you just type in validate radio button and click on it, you're going to see the step. And in this case, I just took a demo application and validating whether the banana radio button is checked, right? So if you go to the properties panel, you can um, click on which status is expected checked or unchecked as well, right? So this way we make validating radio buttons really easy and similarly of course when you have radio buttons the obvious thing which we had to do was uh see whether we could validate uh check boxes as well so if you just like radio buttons if you type in checkbox then you're going to get a validate checkbox option and um and that's how you actually add it and right now i don't have any application open but it's very similar to the radio button where you see the check and uncheck options as well okay so the next thing we did was 
we uh, made our extract value step much smarter. So let's just take a step back and first understand what extract value is. Say um, I had this demo application and it had a lot of pricing details, okay? And say I wanted to extract the value of something from the web page before you had to add custom code uh, to do something that inner text or inner HTML to get the text. But we didn't want people strain. So we actually added an extract value step, which is pretty much the exact same thing, a built-in step. In this case, I'm extracting the value, the price of $1,183.46 from the page. That's what happened. But now with the extract value step, we add a couple of more options. When you extract, you can either extract the entire string or you could extract the number or you could extract the date or you could use your own regular expression and do the extraction, right? And if you use a number or data options, you can see you, you can extract the first date or the last date or all dates. Then if it's a number, you want to extract, say for example, in this price, I have this dollar sign. I don't want this dollar sign to appear. So I could just say extract just all the numbers or just the last number and so on. So the exact value step, we made it much more smarter uh, and give you much more control of doing stuff. The next one was export CSV option. So currently, we have uh, a number of uh, cybersecurity customers, banking customers, and also government customers. And these organizations have a lot of audits where they have, they have to have data of what tests were ran, when, what browsers at any given period of time, and they have to house everything in a document repository, right? So people are requesting us saying, hey, is there any way to export your test results in a CSV format? So we heard our customers and we precisely gave that option. So if you see over here, you have to export the CSV option. So any of your test results, so you can just come to the reports page and do export to CSV. And then you're gonna see uh, CSV like this generated and it exactly shows you what suite ran at what time, when was the test exported, this um, run export happened, what is status, what browsers, etc. So you get all those details. And we also, of course, went one step further and said, you know what, we're gonna also give you the flexibility to export your test list, the list of test, uh, tests you have for the project. So you can do export to CSV on a test list level as well, right? So that was one thing. And just a couple of more things uh, which I wanted to quickly cover was the advanced merge option. So some of you may be familiar that say you're using Git and try to merge, you're gonna get a notification on what you're doing right now, whether you're trying to override someone's changes and what merge conflicts are happening and information like that. Similarly, I was uh, talking to you about the branching feature, remember? Now, we also add, uh, added extra functionality to let the users know what exactly is getting merged when you try to do a merge. So say, for example, um, I already have a branch named de demo to mark here. And say, when I click on merge, you're going to get a, a detailed report on what you're trying to merge. So here's telling you that these are the four tests you're trying to merge uh, and these are the different suites you're trying to merge and then you can also look at the source and then when you click on merge then the merge happens right so that's something to keep in mind and if there's no merge conflicts then you're going to get a message saying the two branches look completely identical right so advanced merge is something which we did as well. Last but not the least, the uh, one of the most time-consuming aspect of a tester's job is troubleshooting problems and finding why a test actually failed, right? We spend a lot of time doing that. To help 
people quickly troubleshoot problems, what we did was we added advanced analytics. So if you see over here, you're going to get a failure summary report on the right side of any test which failed, telling you exactly what happened. So say, for example, you have 250 tests and 100 tests failed because of a particular variable change, right? You would, you would get a report here saying 100 tests failed because of this variable change, right? And if you see over here, it says the expected parameter was this, but the actual was something else. And when you click on it, you immediately go to the test uh, which had the failure. And then you can open that test in a separate tab because they hover over it. You have the new tab option. And then you can understand the failure better. So in this case, if you see there was a failure and if you see over here, param two equal to one was expected, but it found param equal to one and param two equal to one, right? And of course, with our multi-tab indicator, it exactly shows you what tab that it's failed on as well. But anywho, so you are going to get exact summary of different failure points, right? Let's see whether there are multiple failure points because that'll be a good example. So if you see over here, for example, it says two tests failed because of pixel validation and one test failed because of the expected and the expected text was not the same, right? So you can filter it like this or you can filter it like this. So it's up to you. And we also made uh, advancements in our bug capture feature, which is one of the most widely used features of Testim. So just to refresh your memory on what a bug capture feature is, say for uh, example, uh, say for example, you have the calculator, let's just say calculator app, right? And uh, say this is your web page and you have a bug. What you could do is you, we have a test in Chrome extension and you can literally capture a video on a bug scenario, scenario right from here, or you can open even testing right from here. Say for example, I'm capturing a video on the bug scenario from here, right? And say for example, four plus four should be equal to say 10. What I can do is stop it, then highlight exactly where the problem is and do whatever color coding I want and click on publish. And here we have an option of publishing this report in Jira, Trello, Slack, or GitHub. You literally have to just give your uh, Jira URL and then the steps automatically get created for you without even you typing it along with the screenshot and the video of the bug scenario, right? And you literally can create a bug report in the same format uh, within a matter of a minute. So we uh, made some advancements here as well because it might, now it's much faster. In terms of the integrations again, so if you go to the integration step, we integrate with GitHub, Desfile, Epic Tools. We also integrate with Jira, Trello, Slack, and GitHub as well. I know this was probably a lot of information overload, but I was just excited to show you some of the features we released in testing, which are really widely used. We also released a lot of other features as well, um, but these were uh, some of the highlights and are used widely. In case of any questions, uh, remember that you always have a chat window and you can contact any of us at any point of time uh, and we'll answer your questions. And also we have our help docs under educate and visit our docs. And also you're going to get a recording of this webinar. I know there's only one minute left. Let me see whether we have questions. Yeah. So there were a couple of questions and four other questions. I'll make sure I answer them when I send everyone the blog post with the link of the video and a summary of what we talked about today. Okay. So is conditional testing possible if you want to use the same test for several data sets? Yes, the conditional testing is possible. That is a great question. So the way to do that is for um, 
any step, you have an option of when to run the step. So you can run a particular step or a reusable component based on an element text, based on element being visible, or you can add your own custom code to run a particular step. And when you actually add a condition, you're gonna see a diamond icon like what you see over here. So um, yes, conditions are possible. And the best example would be login scenario. When you're already logged in, you don't want to keep trying to log into the application. So in those cases, you can make the reusable components a condition uh, by controlling when to run the step. Uh, next question is depending on the data, the, the test does different things. Yeah, so based on the data, you can do different things. It's based on how you want to structure your test. You have test suites, test plans, um, labels, uh, and you can control the ordering of which test runs when. We also have an advanced feature called config file run hooks, which is basically a, a .js file. You can write your own code, talk to any NPM package, uh, and you can talk to external databases, SQL databases, execute Python scripts during runtime, and you can do a lot of other options as well. Again, we have a help that related to that, and that should be useful. Cool, so I know we have one minute past the uh, hour, so, Thanks so much for attending this webinar and everyone is going to get an email with all the details we discuss in this webinar, including the video recording as well. So thank you and have a great day.